My name is Tom Repass of Canyon Rim Honeybees in Western South Dakota. I'm a queen bee breeder, and thus genetics, as well as genetic diversity in honeybees, is very important to me. In this presentation, I talk about genetic diversity in honeybees and why it's important for beekeepers. Many times I am asked by new beekeepers, what is the best type of honeybee to get? The answer to that question is complicated and it depends. It depends on the reasons that you have for keeping bees, it depends on where you are located, and many other things. There is not one best single type of honeybee. In this presentation I'll talk about the diversity of traits and characteristics of honeybees and why diversity, genetic diversity, is important. I'll also discuss some of the efforts to improve genetic diversity in North America. And then finally, what does this all mean for beekeepers? The origins and types of honeybees. It is estimated that there are over 20,000 species of bees worldwide. Now most of them are solitary bees. Uh, fewer are bees that are eusocial, which include honeybees, bumblebees, and some other types of bees. Out of all of these species, there are eight species of honeybee with a total of 43 species amongst them. The two most important species for humans are Apis serrana, the eastern or Asian honeybee, and then Apis mellifera, the European or western honeybee. This map shows distribution of honeybees around the world, and as you can see, most species are isolated to uh, Asia and southern Asia with the pink Apis mellifera being distributed by humans worldwide with the exception of deserts, high mountains, the subarctic, as well as Antarctica and some islands. Long before humans were beekeepers, we were honey hunters. These drawings of rock art were found all over through the world uh, and it shows how humans have been using bees uh, as a resource uh, some of them it, are fairly recognizable, showing the single large combs of the giant Asian honeybee, Apis dorsata, and some of this is still going on even now. Here we see a honey hunter trying to cut off some of the large single combs of Apis dorsata from cliff faces in Asia and uh, some of these are hundreds of feet up in the air so this is quite a dangerous uh, occupation. And then there's Apis florea, the tiny dwarf honeybee. Uh, these are only about the size of a housefly. They form single comb nests in brush uh, and in some places this is harvested uh, not only for the honey, but also uh, as a source of protein from the brood. And this is uh, some of the nests being offered for sale uh, at a market. Now at first we thought that Apis mellifera, the honeybee, originated from Africa, similar to humans, and then they moved out of Africa to Europe and Asia with the uh, receding of the glaciers at the end of the Ice Age. More recent research looking at the genetics and genetic relationships of Apis mellifera suggests that it actually originated from Asia, which makes sense if you think about all the other, every other species of honeybee is in Asia, it would not make sense that it originated in Africa uh, and then moved to Asia. And looking at the lineages, the, the various mitotypes, the various types of genetic relationships, uh, it shows that the a lineage, the Africanized, African bees in Africa, uh, likely branched off separately and they came from separate origins rather than the African population of bees existing first and then branching off to become uh, European and Asian uh, located Apis mellifera. Before I go any further, I would like to discuss some of the terminology that we're using just so that it's clear. A species, of course, is a group of individuals which can interbreed with, in, with each other, and within a species there are what we call subspecies. These are variations, uh, but they are within the same species. 
Uh, then there's what we call a race of honeybee or an ecotype. This is a type of bee that is adapted to a certain region or climate through natural selection. Uh, beekeepers may breed certain stocks or strains of honeybee. Basically, it's a group of bees that have a combination of traits that's recognizable. And then finally, we may have a hybrid or a crossbreed. Uh, this may be intentional or unintentional when two different subspecies or stocks of bees cross with each other. Over time, Apis mellifera western honeybees became adapted to the local environment and conditions. Some of these adaptations include having colony cycles to the timing of local floral resources. Uh, for example, some colonies build up very quickly in the spring when pollen is coming in, but then they shut down brood production later when there's a dearth. Not all honeybees do this to the extent as some do. Uh, forming a winter cluster in colder climates, obviously this allows European honeybees to survive, where bees from Africa and the tropics might not have that, and thus they're less likely to survive in a colder climate. Uh, some of the other behaviors we see in tropical bees might be absconding, migratory swarming, or increased defensiveness in places where bees have uh, pred predation both by humans and animals. Eventually, these variations resulted in 31 recognized subspecies of Apis mellifera, all of which can be crossed with each other. They're divided into four major branches, which we call mitotypes, after mitochondrial DNA. Uh, the A, obviously, is the bees from Africa, uh, which would be Africanized bees in North America. The M mitotype would be the Northwestern European subspecies. Uh, this would be the German black or the British black bee. The C mitotype, those are from southwestern Europe. These, the, the, the ones that are known from that branch are the Italians and the Carniolans. And then finally, there's the O mitotype, which is the Middle Eastern subspecies. Uh, the Caucasians would be an example of that. There actually are a few other mitotypes as well, but these are the four main groups. And this is just a, a picture of the natural distribution of these various mitotypes, understanding that bees have been moved around a lot. And so the, the, the areas where they exist now are far and wide away from where they originally originated from. Uh, now, if you keep this slide in your memory and, and then this one as well, you can see so some of these are located in certain areas. And if you look at the uh, ecosystems, the, the climates and, and type of uh, plant life, you can see that these are very much overlap uh, certain types of uh, terrain and climate. So these types of honeybees were adapted to those local conditions. We don't know when humans first began keeping bees. Uh, probably what happened is someone found a colony in a hollow tree or log, maybe one they cut down or one that fell down, and they, they cut it off, cut off the piece that had the hollow part with the bees in it, and they brought it back so that could be closer, more easily accessed, uh, perhaps protected from animal predators or even human thieves. And over time, we began uh, transporting bees all around the world to, to basically every continent other than Antarctica, and various strains have been developed through bee beating, breeding and selection. I put this slide up because it, it refers to honeybee breeds. We really need to keep in mind that the differences between types of honeybees is not quite as cut and dry as, say, a breed of cattle or a breed of dog. There's a lot of overlap, and there's also a lot of uh, inbreeding, interbreeding between the different strains because most of uh, the bees that we purchase are open mated. And so if you get a carniolan, there's probably going to be some Italian genetics in there. And that might not necessarily be a bad thing because genetic diversity does allow the bees to be uh, better, healthier and better able to survive. Let's talk about some of the types of bees that are commonly available for beekeepers in the U.S. to purchase. So the most common is the Italian honeybee, Apis mellifera ligustica. Uh, the bees tend to be light, and the queen is light, golden, easy to find. Originally brought to the U.S. from Italy in the mid-1800s. Uh, they're excellent honey producers, gentle. Uh, one problem is they do have a large population year-round. They produce bees like there's no tomorrow. That might not be so good uh, in a situation where there's a drought. Now you have a lot of bees that you're going to have to feed. They don't shut down brood production as quickly as other strains might. And some Italian strains may not winter quite as well in cold climates also, though I, uh, there are Italian strains that have been selected to do well up north. The Minnesota hygienics are very similar to Italians because they were developed from Italian strains. 
Uh, they were developed from lines of Italian bees that originally were part of the Starline hybrid breeding program that was in the 1970s and 80s. And after that breeding program ended, then some of these lines were used to, uh, to develop the Minnesota Hygienics, selected for increased hygienic behavior and wintering ability. Uh, they do have increased hygienic behavior, which helps them resist brood diseases such as chalk brood and European fallow brood. It's somewhat questionable how good that behavior is to help with resisting varroa. Uh, some beekeepers have had excessive, excessive defensiveness with some of the Minnesota, Minnesota hygienics. Uh, this is an example of selecting too much one type of characteristic, maybe losing some of the positive features of another characteristic that you might want. Then there's the Cordovans. These are not really a strain or a stock, but rather a, a coloring uh, due to genetics. And the Italian Cordovans are bright yellow, beautiful looking bees. Other races that are, have the Cordovan genetics may be more purple looking. It's really a recessive mutation in coloration, and it's been used uh, for research to study the breeding behavior of honeybees. For example, where the queens went to mate, what drones they mated with. Uh, but some beekeepers like the light col coloration. Uh, the traits of these bees will really depend on what the, the, the strain is from which they were originally derived. And then there's the Carniolan. These are darker uh, bees. They originally were from the Australian Alps, Slovenia, the Carpathian Mountains of Hungary. They're the second most common bee in the US. They're known for being very gentle. Some strains might have increased swarming. I haven't seen that as much. They do build up quickly. And so if you are not prepared, not giving them enough space, then they may want to swarm quickly because of that. They are very sensitive to changes in floral incoming floral resources, which means they will shut down brood production very quickly in a drought or uh, at the end of the season. Uh, because of this, they tend to winter very well in cold climates, uh, and they're very frugal with the use of their stores. Frugal means they, they do not eat through their honey stores quite as much as, say, other strains might. The Caucasians are originally from uh, the Caucasus Mountains in the Republic of Georgia in the former Soviet Union. These are very dark bees. The queens can be a pure black, very strikingly beautiful, although if they're not marked, it might be difficult to see them uh, when they're crawling on the comb. They're known for being very gentle. They're considered to be the most gentle strain of bees. They do well in cold climates, no surprise. Uh, they tend to use a lot of propolis, and that's why this strain of bee was less popular uh, because it would be inconvenient for the beekeeper to pry apart the frames or the hives themselves. Of course, we've learned that propolis may actually be a good thing and have antimicrobial, anti-disease properties. So now we're not really selecting against propolis as much as we might have done uh, back in the day. Uh, they also have a longer tongue than other types of bees, which means they might be able to take advantage of other sources of nectar, for example, red clover that other bees might not be able to utilize as easily. Then there are the Russian bees. These are variable, and they were originally brought uh, in with the permission of the USDA in the late 1990s with the intent of improving mite resistance of the bees that we already had. Uh, the bees in the Primorsky Peninsula of Russia were the first honeybees that were exposed to the Varroa mite, and it is thought by having that long uh, time of exposure has allowed them to have some more mite resistant. Uh, they are very sensitive to changes in full resources, uh, and they winter well in cold climates, not a surprise. They do have rapid buildup of population in the spring, which if you're not prepared for that might result in higher rate of swarming. The buckfast is variable. It's not a subspecies, but a strain or a stock of bees that was developed by Brother Adam of Buckfast Abbey from a number of foundation subspecies. Uh, if you can find any of Brother Adam's books, there's a lot of great information, very applicable even now, decades later. Um, of course, they didn't have the knowledge of, of genetics that we do now and the ability to you know, assess DNA, but a lot of the the basics of a breeding program are outlined by Brother Adam, and they can be very useful for those of us who are breeding bees even today. They originally were bred in the United Kingdom to be tolerant of tracheal mites, uh, and as a result they do t well, well in cold, wet climates like the UK. Uh, they're gentle. You really can't find them purebred buckfast in the US anymore. There were breeders selling buckfast up into the 80s, uh, but they really were not pure buckfast. 
Uh, if you have access to Buckfast in Canada, they do bring uh, over new stock from Europe. They're allowed. Uh, they're allowed to do that up in Canada, and so you might be able to access, get some Buckfast uh, through that. The Saskatraz was a hybrid developed in Saskatchewan, Canada, through the Saskatraz project. And they basically selected from foundation stock that had excellent honey production, good wintering ability, and increased varroa tolerance and resistance to brood diseases, as well as hygienic behavior. The Saskatraz that we have in the U.S., uh, they're bred by Oliveira's honeybees from purebred Saskatraz mothers, but the offspring that you're uh, purchasing were open-mated, probably with carniolan and drones and other drones that are in the area. So they're not pure Saskatraz bees that you're having, uh, but rather Saskatraz that was crossed with some of the, the bees that were available, the drones that were available um, at, uh, through that breeder. Then there's VSH, Varroa Sensitive Hygiene. Uh, it occurs in every strain and the appearance can be variable. Uh, it's not, it's, it's basically a trait. Uh, it used to be uh, known as suppressed mite reproduction, but was renamed Varroa Sensitive Hygiene. The bees are able to detect and remove brew that has been affected with Varroa. And the mites that even are not removed, they have a lower rate of mite reproduction. Uh, even if you purchase this and you open mate with your own bees, a 50% VSH still has some good resistance. Although with further crosses, you will lose the VSH unless you're very specifically selecting for it. And then, of course, we cannot forget Apis mellifera scutellata, the Africanized honeybee. Obviously, I'm not recommending this for you to keep uh, as a, a, you know in your backyard or, or wherever. Uh, but these have come uh, across the border and are now uh, within the southern portions of the U.S. These bees were brought over to Brazil, hoping to improve some of the traits. Uh, when they cross with European honeybees so that they would do better in the tropics. Unfortunately, the traits, the, the Africanized honeybees were so successful, the vast majority of them have completely replaced the European uh, genetics in the places that they spread to. They are much more defensive than European honeybees. Uh, they do very well in the tropics. Places like Brazil have basically embraced them. Um, obviously, you're not going to keep them where there, there's a chance that they will interact with humans or with animals. Uh, they're not going to be managed as intensively. They don't like that. Besides being very defensive, they may abscond. Uh, so these are bees that are, you know, not something that I would be recommending any of us uh, be having in our backyards, but they are adapted uh, for uh, well for their own survival in their in the tropical uh, climates, but they do not do well further north because they do not form a winter cluster. Let's talk about the diversity of honeybee traits and characteristics. There's many diverse variable traits and characteristics, color, defensiveness, hardiness, hygienic behavior, and it goes on and on. Some of these traits may be desirable for the beekeeper, while others might be undesirable, even though they might be good for the bees. A good example is defensiveness. You know, we, we don't want um, our, our bees to be very defensive and, and to, uh, but that might be good for a colony if it comes under attack by a you know an animal predator. That's actually very good for the bees, even though it might not be good for anybody wanting to keep those bees. So there are so many types of bees available. Which is the best? I get asked this question a lot. Well, the answer is it depends. You know, if you were going to raise cattle, uh, which is the best type of cattle to raise? This kind. Well, yeah, maybe if you were planning on being a dairy farmer and you wanted to produce lots of milk. Or maybe if you were going to produce beef cattle, you might want to bring some of this guy's genetics into your herd. Or if you were in a southern location, maybe you'd want some of this. That, that would allow them to survive in places in a, in a hot tropical climate. Or then there are these, the Texas Longhorns, which originally were feral cattle in Texas. Or if you were living up north in a very cold uh, climate, then perhaps you might want the Scotch Highland. And now the differences between bees are not quite as striking uh, as with cattle, but this kind of gives you the idea that, you know, there is no one best type of bee. Uh, there's only t traits that you prefer versus uh, maybe you don't. One trait that's important, of course, is gentleness. You know, I, I will not tolerate a hot hive. 
and not only not stinging me, but also just being calm on the comb. You know, you can have bees that might not be defensive. They're not flying off to, to sting you, but they, they're very runny and they drop off the comb and, uh, and they're very nervous as compared to bees that just stick on the comb like Velcro and they don't even hardly move, even if you set it out there, you know, next to the hive for 10, 15 minutes. Basically, do you want bees like this or do you want bees like this? I prefer uh, bees that I can maybe open up on a, during a honey flow and not have to totally suit up every single time I'm around them. Then there's brood production, spring buildup, colony population. We talked about how the Italian honeybees tend to have larger populations year-round. That might be good if you're planning on taking your bees to California to pollinate almonds, but it might not be quite as good if you're trying to winter in place and you live in the far, uh, in the frigid north. Then, of course, there's mite resistance. You could select based on just mite counts, or you could look at hygienic behavior. This is after liquid nitrogen froze some of the brood comb to look at what percentage was removed, and it looks like most, almost all of it, except for those two capped brood down there that were not removed, almost all of it was removed. You could look at mite biting behavior, or for that matter, VSH trait. You know, and why is it important to breed for mite resistance? Well, Varroa mites really decimated honeybees since they became introduced into the U.S. I can remember what it was like before we had Varroa mites, and it was it was a lot easier. You know, now you have to pay attention to Varroa mites or you will lose colonies. This is a slide from Dr. Megan Milbraith, but basically a lot of new beekeepers, unfortunately, have wishful thinking that, oh, I, I didn't see any mites, they'll be fine, and then they lose their bees, and they buy more bees, and they lose their bees, and they buy more bees, and it gets expensive after a while. And so either they get out of beekeeping or they, they start taking Varroa seriously. But the ultimate goal for those of us that are breeding bees is we'd like bees that are fairly resistant, that you know will not need to have all the treatments that we have to do, you know whether it's chemical treatments or you know, integrated pest management or whatever we're having to do, it, ideally it would be wonderful to not have to worry about Varroa quite as much as we do now. Of course, honey production, obviously. I mean, unless you're having bees as pets or you're keeping them around for pollination, you know, it is nice to get a little bit of that sweet reward at the end of the season and, and produce some honey. We also talk about dry versus wet cappings. This is not as important now as back in the day when much more comb honey was being produced. It's purely a cosmetic, uh, uh, it's purely cosmetic. The dry cappings basically have a little air bubble between the honey and the wax and it gives them those beautiful white cappings which, you know, if this is sitting on a shelf in a store, the customer might, might just want as compared to the less beautiful but still just as tasty comb honey that it has a wet capping. And this is genetically inherited overwintering ability, which I, I breed for. It's actually one of the easiest things to breed for because, well, if they died, you can't breed from them. The frugality. So another thing I breed for is how much honey, how many stores do they go through? You know, if, if you have them survive, but you got to feed them a whole, gallons and gallons of syrup every fall, that's, that's not as good as if they you know, save their own honey, and then they didn't eat that much, and they didn't need to be fed up as much as as, as other colonies might. Uh, do they prefer swarming versus supersedure for queen replacement? Now, all bees will swarm. That's a natural behavior. But some bees, they have an older queen that's starting to fail. They might say, you know, let's replace her, and, and we'll swarm at the same time, you know, two for one. Whereas other colonies might not swarm. They might supersede that queen without actually swarming or, or splitting the hive, which is preferable as a beekeeper because if they swarm, they might lose some honey production later that year. Not the end of the world, and, you know, you're, you're helping... Uh, repopulate the feral bee population in your area, but it might not be something that you want as a beekeeper if you're intending to make a honey crop. Pollen gathering ability. This is not selected for as aggressively now. Myself, if I have colonies that save a lot of pollen uh, and have that in the brood nest or near the brood nest, that can be very useful midwinter when they start uh, raising more brood. Uh, back in the 50s, there was were breeding programs selecting for bees that were effective at gathering and pollinating alfalfa. Honeybees tend to avoid the snap trigger mechanism of the alfalfa flower, and they actually developed strains of honeybees that were more effective at pollinating alfalfa. We've gotten away from that because now they're able to use the alfalfa leaf cutter bees and other bees to pollinate for seed uh, production, but this is something that has been bred for in the past. And the some breeding programs select for queen longevity. This is a marker of uh, 
queen bee as well as colony health. If a queen bee is able to live, you know, three or four or five years, you know that she's healthy, you know that the colony is healthy. And so this is more of an overall marker of colony fitness and survival. Other traits that some beekeepers may breed for, responsiveness to stimulative feeding, maintaining large high population year round, Myself, I don't really want that. I, I want. I don't want to have a large population in the middle of the winter and have all those mouths to feed, and potentially that hive might end up starving to death before spring comes. But some beekeepers may want a large population. Uh, who might they be? Well, if you're intending to take your bees to pollinate uh, in California, the almonds. You, you know, if you have a small population, you might not be able to a very small cluster. You might not be able to take them uh, for pollination. But if you have a large population, then you would. Package bee producers, they want their colonies to produce lots and lots of bees uh, so that they can have extra bees to sell. Uh, this might be good for the package bee producer, but if you're using those type of bees to try to survive, you know, in a more rigorous northern climate, that might not be such a positive thing. I'm not aware of anybody breeding for propolis, but I know that many beekeepers were breeding against it for many years due to the inconvenience of having a lot of propolis in the hives. But we've learned that it may have some antimicrobial effects and it might be good for the health of the hive. So myself, even though I keep track of propolis, I'm not selecting for or against it. It's just an observation that I keep track of so that if someday, perhaps maybe I would like to breed for propolis, I would be able to go back through and look at those lines that tend to have higher rates of propolis uh, production. And then color. You know, I, a good bee comes in every color. I, I do have a soft spot for some of the darker bees, the Carniolans and the Caucasians. But to be honest, um, you know, the color is just cosmetic. If, if I've got a, a colony with a good queen and she happens to be a light queen, I'm not going to pinch her just because of her color if she has all the other traits that I'm breeding for. Let's talk a little bit more about some of the heritability of traits, how well the trait is passed on to the next generation. Some traits are more easily inherited than others. Uh, it, it makes sense, of course, traits that are more easily inherited are easier to successfully breed for as compared to traits that are less inherited. This is an example of, of what we're talking about. Uh, defensiveness is very highly inherited. It makes sense because a colony that's more defensive is more likely to survive. So that's a good trait to be highly inherited. Um, that's a bad thing if you have fairly gentle bees and then Africanized bees moved into your area or your neighbor uh, has a whole bunch of bees and maybe they're not so, uh, you know, they're not so nice and those drones are now breeding with your queens. That could be a problem. But the good thing is you can breed out it out as well. If you can control uh, the breeding population of drones, uh, you can breed out defensiveness fairly quickly within a few generations. Uh, other traits are, are less uh, easily inherited, maybe because there's multiple genes that are uh, that are contributing to that, uh, or maybe it's because it's more uh, dependent upon local environment. Honey production is a good example of that. Uh, you can have a very productive colony, but if it's a bad year, it's not going to produce honey, no matter how good the genetics are. When we talk about heritability H2, we we do it. We use a number to basically tell us how heritable or less heritable a trait might be. If if a heritability was exactly zero, there would be zero genetic influence upon that trait. On the other hand, if the heritability was one, that would mean that 100% of the variation of that trait would be due to genetics. Uh, and most traits are somewhere in the middle, leaning towards being little influence, genetic influence, to a lot of genetic influence. So the factors which affect the expression of whatever trait or characteristic we're talking about, the genes themselves, of course, which we call genotype, environmental factors, and then the effects of non-related genes, which altogether is the expression of a trait called the phenotype. Um, you know, an example of this might be, uh, let's say you have a population of bees that the genetics uh, show that they're high honey producers environmental factors play a role. If it's a drought year, they're, even though they might have high honey hoarding behavior, they're not going to make a lot of honey no matter how good their genetics are. And there might be other genes that are not exactly related. You know, for example, 
that high honey producing, high honey hoarding stock of bees, if it happens to also have high brood production, now you're going to have a highly, a very strong hive that is got good honey production. And if you happen to put it in a place where there's something blooming, uh, then you might make a have a really great honey producing uh, phenotype of of honey bee. So some examples of heritability. Brood rearing. Uh, in the winter, that is strongly uh, genetically inherited. It's an abnormal time to be raising brood. All bees will have some brood at some point, even if it's a very tiny amount. Uh, there might be times when there's no brood present. Uh, but some colonies are you know, raising brood through the winter, which may be okay if you're in a more southern climate. But if you're up north, that might not be a very good thing to be doing. Honey production. European is much more inherited uh, than in Africanized honeybees. Honey weight, however, is not quite as inherited. Um, total honey production, not quite either. Again, because there's other factors that affect honey production. How large the population of that hive is, uh, you know, what is in bloom, what type of year you're having. So that's not quite as inherited. There is some genetic uh, inheritance, of course, but not quite as strong as some of these other traits. Now looking at uh, comparing European E versus Africanized A, looking at other behaviors, defensiveness, uh, you know, Africanized bees, are it's well known, they're very defensive. European honeybees, though, the time to react is very genetically inherited. So that's something that you can breed out fairly quickly, or unfortunately, you get it bred into it uh, unintentionally uh, if you're not paying attention. And then the number of bees responding, the European is also very genetically inherited, where with Africanized bees, not as much because, well, you know, let's be honest, a lot of them tend to respond if they're set off. Well, let's talk about correlations. Are different genetic traits related to each other? I don't know how many times I've heard this over the years. The mean hives are the ones that make the most honey. I know that the bees in this hive like to sting, but I don't want to requeen them. They make me so much honey. I like having them around. The truth is, though, colony defensiveness is not genetically related to honey production, despite how many times we've observed this and how strongly some beekeepers hold that opinion. Looking at research into the honey production and honey hoarding shows that there is no genetic relationship to defensiveness and honey hoarding. The H2 is almost zero. Defensiveness and honey production, very low. Honey yield and defensiveness in Italian honeybees. There is no genetic relationship between colony defensiveness and honey production. So what explains the observation that some defensive honeybees happen to be the more productive? I've seen it myself. We need to remember that an association of traits together may be due to non-genetic relationships or indirect relationships. We need to remember association does not mean causation. So why would a defensive colony also be more productive? Well, if you think about it, which type of colony is the one that's going to make you the most honey in any given year? A strong colony or a weak colony? The stronger colony, all things being equal, obviously is more likely to make you honey in a year. So let's say you happen to have some colonies that have defensive behavior. Which one is going to send out a lot more bees after you once it gets set off? A strong colony or a weak colony? The strong colony. So a strong colony is more likely to be defensive and also more likely to be productive. But that doesn't mean that the defensiveness and the honey production are directly related, which means you could have a gentle colony, as long as it's strong, produce just as much honey as a more defensive colony if they're equally strong. Here's some other genetic relationships. Uh, honey production and brood production are strongly related, and that makes sense because the more the greater the brood production the more bees you're going to have which means the more honey production you're possibly going to get if it's a good honey year other traits not quite as as closely related such as swarming behavior or hygienic behavior and honey production
This is a slide from Randy Oliver's website, and it's a very good slide because there's trade-offs. When we're doing selective breeding, there might be trade-offs. You know, we've talked a little bit about how some bees that were developed for hygienic behavior might not be quite as gentle because they weren't paying attention to that. Or let's say you want a very large colony size, well, they might not be as frugal. You know, maybe they're going to um, eat more honey in the winter. Um, on the other hand, if you want a frugal hive through the winter that doesn't mean eat as much honey, the population of those bees might be, uh, might be less. We've talked a lot about genetics, heritability, genetic diversity, different types of bees, but why does it even matter? There's been numerous studies to show that bees that are more genetically diverse have higher immunity, lower infections, increased colony growth, increased chance of survival for that colony. Being genetically diverse is a very good thing for honeybees to have. This study showed that there was a higher mortality of the varroa motes, mites in hives that had greater genetic diversity, whereas the colonies that were genetically diverse were less likely to have nosema. Now looking at locally adapted stock versus non-local, uh, this study done in Italy, looking at Italian honeybees obviously in Italy, was comparing the origin of the bees and location and even within Italy, they found that Italian honeybees can be locally adapted. So if the bees were transported, say, from the lowlands, the southern part of Italy, up into the mountains, they didn't do as well up there as, as compared to if they were kept in their original location, and vice versa. If the mountain area hunt, Italian honeybees were transported to the lowlands or further south, they didn't do quite as well. Another study looked at six different genotypes across six clusters across Europe. The colonies were not treated for mites and the local genotypes had higher populations and tended to collect more honey as compared to the non-local ones. So both genotype as well as environment affected colony development, population, and overwintering ability. Yet another study with Carniolan honeybees, two different populations, a high altitude and a low altitude, one in Austrian Alps and one on the Pannonian Plain in Croatia, the colonies of introduced bees had lower survival rates at both locations, no matter whether it was the mountain bees brought down to the plain or the bees from the lowlands brought to the higher altitude. Neither did as well as, as they did in their original location. So it seems that local genotypes of honeybees have higher survival than non-local ones. And this is something that we as bee breeders might want to focus on to try to minimize colony losses um, and, and try to have bees that are more adapted to whatever location we happen to be in. But here's the challenge. Bees are relatively new to North America. And these are the 161 ecoregions in North America. It's theoretically possible if we did not move bees around, we did not buy bees from other areas and we just let them go feral that you could theoretically have a type of honeybee adapted to each one or each general region of the U.S. Now of course we're buying bees from all over and we're bringing them in and we're moving them around so this is probably unlikely to to happen but it is food for thought as a bee breeder to think about you know where I'm at up in the Black Hills of South Dakota maybe the bees that are doing well in say Florida you know or California might not be as it quite adapted to my local conditions. Lack of genetic diversity is problematic in bees. Lower survival, increased susceptibility to diseases, lower honey production, decreased population growth, and then poor brood pattern due to non-viable brood. Honeybees have what we call sex alleles, and if they are homozygote, that is, they are the two, two of the same, that is non-viable. Those brood will die. And the photo there is showing what it would look like with a 50% brood pattern. Now, that might not be from inbreeding. It could be from varroa mites. It could be from anything. But if you have excessive inbreeding, you could have where 50% of the brood will not survive and have a very spotty brood pattern. Obviously, this is not what you want. And it's thought that you need at least 10 or 12 or more uh, sex alleles in any given population of bees to avoid this from happening. That's why it's important if you're breeding bees to not be breeding from the same lines over and over and over again. So in nature, what do honeybees do naturally to try to 
prevent this inbreeding and try to increase genetic diversity. For one, queens mate with as many drones as possible, probably at least 10 or 20 drones at a time. And you can see, you know, these some of these drones may be related, may be from the same colony, but they may be from other colonies. And so you can see how you could have so many thousands of potential genetic combinations through this. The queens tend to mate further away from the colony than the drones do. This is good because, you know, they're going to not be mating with their own brothers. The goal of the drones is they're trying to be up in the drone congregation areas for as long as possible. Most drones never mate with a queen, but if they do, they've won the genetic lottery. And so by minimizing time flying back and forth, that is going to a drone congregation area closer to their colony, that means they're more likely to be up in the air at the time that a queen happens to come into that drone congregation area, and they're more likely to win that lottery of mating with a queen. On the other hand, queens fly further away. They're going on a mating flight once in their life or maybe two or three times in their life. So for them, it is worth it to spend a little bit more time flying further away to get some more diverse genetics. The study in the United Kingdom showed that the farthest recorded mating was 9.3 miles away. Just think about that. That queen flew 9.3 miles to mate. She didn't just go there and mate. She had to fly around there mating with several drones and then fly the 9.3 miles back. It's unbelievable to think a little bee can, can do that. And then finally, honeybees have a much greater rate of genetic combination as compared to any other species. So what is recombination? Well, it's just a little basic genetics, and I have oversimplified this. Uh, in normal reproduction, half of the genes come from the father and half of the genes come to the mother, and they stay on the same chromosome generation after generation. But in recombination, the genes can move over to other parts of the other chromosomes through translocation or crossing over. And, and again, this is oversimplified. Uh, this is showing uh, crossing over. But basically, the genes can end up on different arms of the chromosome, different parts of the chromosome. And this is just one type of recombination. There's many types. In honeybees, Recombination occurs five times more than other insects such as fruit flies and 20 times more than humans and mammals. This can be very challenging. It's good for the honeybees to have such diversity, but it's very challenging for the beekeepers when the, not only is the deck of cards shuffled every time the, the bees breed, but the cards themselves actually get mixed up. So you have different, imagine the pieces and bits and pieces of the cards themselves are put onto different cards and how confusing that can be uh, and how challenging that can be if you're a, a breeder of bees trying to, you know, hone in on a certain genetic trait, especially if that trait is controlled by multiple, uh, you know, it's polygenetic and there's multiple genes contributing. So in nature, honeybees maintain an increased genetic diversity through mating with lots of unrelated drones. An increased rate of recombination uh, helps the honeybees maintain genetic variability. But it, it is makes it does make it a challenge for those of us who are breeding bees. And here's a slide from Randy Oliver's site, uh, Scientific Beekeeping, just kind of showing you what, what I'm talking about. So in the lower left, you've got, let's say you spend big money on this breeder queen, and she's just the, the dream queen that you want. And she's got those green genetics, whatever that might be, and you decide to mate them, maybe with drones from your own uh own colonies to try to to get some of those genetics from that queen and the first generation you know you do have 50 50 and so that's pretty good and let's say you decided to pick the best daughter out of all of those to breed from um, down here uh, and and so that's who you're going to graft in the next generation but let's say some other drones moved in maybe another beekeeper dropped some hives not too far and some of those drones are now getting into the drone congregation areas and you can imagine how this can really shuffle by the, you know, by the third generation. Everything is really shuffled and mixed up, and you've lost a lot of those original genetics. Again, this is really good for the bees to have such genetic diversity, but it might not be so good for those of us who are trying to breed for certain traits uh, that, that have multiple genetics. It can be really hard to maintain that generation after generation. Let's talk about some of the efforts to improve genetic diversity, but before we do that, we should probably talk about the history of the honeybee in North America. 
The honeybee is not native to the New World. It was brought over with the first European settlers uh, in the 1600s, and by the 1700s and 1800s, feral honeybees were widespread and common throughout eastern North America. Uh, they didn't get past the Great Plains uh, until they were helped by humans later. Uh, there were some other introductions as well, uh, even up into Sitka, Alaska by Russian missionaries, and then later in Brazil and Mexico. The original bees, the, the black bees, the German black bees and the uh, British black bees, did well in our climate. Uh, but they did have some negatives. They were nervous. Uh, they were more defensive than some of the newer type of bees that we have now. And so searching for a, a better type of bee, other introductions were brought in, the Italian honeybees in the 18 mid-1800s, but then many other types of bees were brought in as well, uh, many of which we no longer uh, have or no longer know about, uh, even though some of those genetics may still persist within our, uh, our uh, feral populations. This is a study that was done uh, looking at feral honeybees in Texas and looking at, at line A, looking at the black, that's the M mitotype, that's the Northern European, the black bees that were brought in. And even after Africanization, uh, the European uh, amounts of European genetics in the feral honeybees decreased, but the amount of the M mitotype, the dark or black honeybees, still persisted, uh, even even after so many centuries after the, the, the original uh, introduction of those bees to the U.S., This is a map looking at some of the introductions of various types of honeybees across the U.S. in the times of when they were introduced. But in 1922, the Honeybee Act restricted subsequent introductions. They were trying to keep out diseases like tracheal mites at that time. It's been said there have been three genetic bottlenecks of honeybee introductions into North America. You cannot introduce every genetic when you bring over dozens or hundreds of, of types of honeybees, uh, you know, some are going to be left behind. So only certain genetics got through that bottleneck coming across on a ship. Then the Varroa mites came in and decimated the feral honeybees and, and also further depleted the uh, genetics. And then finally, there's been a consolidation of large bee breeders, which are also selecting from certain types of bees and not others. It's estimated that commercial queen producers in the U.S. raise about 1 million queens for sale every year. And these are produced from about only 500 queen mothers. Think about that. Think about how little genetic diversity that exists within our, our bee breeding uh, programs across the U.S. But more recently, interest in locally adapted stocks has been increasing. Dr. Larry Connor and some others have encouraged local micro queen breeders to try to produce bees locally. You know, and myself as a, as a queen bee breeder, you know, even even if I was not necessarily selecting for local adapted bees or, or whatnot, it's a very nice uh, source of income for those of us that are sideliners who uh, maybe, you know, they don't want to go big into honey production. Um, you, you know, selling bees to other beekeepers locally is a very nice source of income. And it's also actually, it's just a lot of fun. Unfortunately, though, the results with local stock has been variable and even disappointing. Part of the problem is it's very hard to control the genetics of the bees you're producing. You know, you might be trying to encourage drone production from certain colonies, but if you've got neighbors that are buying bees from all over, it's really hard to keep those genetics from getting into the bees that you're producing. That said, these are still, it's still a worthwhile activity and it's still, uh, useful to have your own queens even if you're not maybe able to select for the genetics quite as tightly as you would like as someone you know like me who's doing instrumental insemination uh you know maybe who has more isolated uh areas to keep their mating yards very few bees were introduced to the u.s after 1922 but in the late 1980s when varroa mites came in there was renewed interest in trying to bring in new genetics that perhaps were more varroa tolerant I remember the Yugo bees that were brought in in the late 80s. Almost no one has been keeping bees and remembers them. Uh, they were basically a strain of Carniolan bees that were supposedly more mite resistant, although I, I don't recollect that I had any experience. I did have some of those Yugo bees, and I didn't recollect that they were any different. They were just nice Carni Carniolan bees. Uh, the Russian bees were brought in from the Primorsky region of, of Russia. 
uh, in the late 90s to early 2000s. Those bees had the longest experience exposed to the varroa mite, and the thought was maybe these bees would be more resistant uh, to mites, having had you know over a century of of exposure to varroa mites. And then in 2008, the USDA gave special permission to bring back drone semen from uh, the old world, from Europe, uh, under strict quarantine and oversight. So beginning in 2008, Washington State University brought in drone semen of Italian bees, Carniolan, and Caucasian bees. The semen was then instrumentally inseminated into virgin honeybees here in the U.S., and then after several generations, they recreated these strains here in the U.S., the protocol, however, was very strict, making sure there were no viruses brought in. Um, the colonies were maintained under strict quarantine before they were released on a case-by-case -case basis. These next set of slides are simply photos from that program uh, showing you some of the places that they had gone to collect some of the semen to bring back to the U.S. Here's an apiary in uh, South Central Italy, which was the source of uh, Italian semen that they had brought back. Here's Dr. Sue Kobe and colleagues uh, collecting carniolan semen to bring back. An another photo of Dr. Kobe uh, looking at a carniolan apiary in Slovenia. That caging apparently is to protect those colonies from a bear attack uh, from some of the bears that uh, wander around in that part of the world. And then finally, here's an apiary in the Caucasus Mountains in the Republic of Georgia, where they had collected some of the semen for some of the Caucasian bees that had been brought back to the U.S. Of course, we might not need to travel quite as far afield to have genetics that we want as we might think. Uh, feral colonies in the U.S. have some genetics that might be distinct from managed colonies. That slide that I had showed you previously of the feral bees in Texas showing you that there were some remnants of some of the introductions that were done centuries earlier. Most of the colonies, the managed colonies in the U.S. are primarily C1 Italian or C2 Carniolan. Here's a map showing all of the different introductions. The red are the C lineage, but as you can see there were other introductions done at various times and over time. Um, and some of the, this is basically looking at feral honeybees and throughout the U.S. and they found different mitotypes uh, from all over. So in some locations, the genetic ghosts of past introductions may still be with us within the feral honeybee population in those places. These are some slides looking at genetics of managed colonies, uh, again from uh, Randy Oliver's site, Scientific Beekeeping. Managed colonies are primarily C1 and C2, Italian and Carniolan. 98% of the managed colonies had some type of C mitotype. But when they looked at feral bees, there was very little. Only 4% was C1, which is Italian. Apparently, the Italian genotype is not very adaptive to be a feral honeybee in the U.S. Uh, more of them were the C2 mitotype or the Carniolan, and they found some of the M mitotype, the black uh northern European black bees, and then some O mitotypes. It's possible that perhaps we could select from some of the genetics of these feral honeybees to try to get some genetics that might be beneficial for what we're doing. They found that uh, feral populations uh, have been genetically distinct, especially those populations that are not near or close to managed uh, commercial colonies. Uh, Hawaii, interestingly enough, has a very high amount. 35% is the M lineage. And then if you go to Maui, it's actually 70% the M mitotype. Of, uh, so that's very fascinating, quite different as compared to the continental U.S. feral honeybees. They found feral colonies in remote areas, such as wildlife refuges, remote islands, places where there's not very many humans and no beekeeping nearby. But in some locations, there's maybe not much of a difference. You know, I, I, I live out here in western South Dakota, and I've, I've done bee lining to find feral colonies. Uh, in some pla isolated places in the Black Hills, you know, they may be 5 or 10 miles away from the nearest, uh, you know, beekeeper. I, those colonies originally came from someone and from somewhere. But if you go out on the prairie where there's commercial beekeepers dropping loads of bees every summer, you find some feral bees, you know, in a cottonwood tree down by the river, there's a strong chance that those are going to be very similar to those managed honeybees as compared to some 
somewhere else where the bees are much further away from managed colonies. Some of the behaviors among feral honeybees that might help them survive, well, for when they're more spread out, uh, of course, mites can spread and disease can spread, but when they're not right next to each other like in a managed yard. They tend to have smaller cavity size, their population is less and they swarm more and swarming might be helpful because of the brood breaks so it might help them manage varroa mites that might not be something that we want as a you know in our managed colonies because when they're swarming you know you might not be making as much honey that year but that's from the standpoint of the the bees themselves more sweet frequent swarming will allow them to repopulate you know cavities hollow trees and, and crevices in the rock you know, where there might have been bees before or haven't been uh, to try to improve the survival of the species. Some feral colonies may have more defensiveness. Uh, this obviously is much more of a bigger deal if you live in a place where there's Africanized genetics. Other traits been theorized but not consistently shown. You know, maybe they have better, you know, behaviors that help them uh, defend against mites as well. So myself, you know, you know I've been... Uh, bee hunting ever since I was a kid, even before I was a, a beekeeper myself. This is a photo of me with my first two hives uh, in 1981 um, when I was just 13 years old. I, I'm a fourth generation beekeeper and so I learned how to do bee hunting when I was a kid mainly because I was curious about where the, the bees were and then I would also try to go in the spring and look for swarms that were cast from those feral colonies because if I could get to them I could catch them and you know free bees was always a very good thing to have it you know then and all, and now and this is from Eva Crane's book showing some of the different types of tools historically that were used uh, to capture foragers on a flower and then feed them you know a little bit of honey to try to get them to form a bee line you know, very similar to the method that uh, Dr. Tom Seeley had uh, talked about in his book. Uh, this has been something that's been going on for generations. Now, as a queen breed breeder, though, I try to bring in some feral genetics into my breeding stock. And I do this if I can capture a swarm in an area that's far from any managed hive. And I also do this by collecting drone semen from colonies that uh, um, are feral colonies that I am able to get up to the entrance, which many of them, they're so located so high, it's, it's impossible to do that safely. Here's a swarm trap that I have put out. I tend to put it away from roadways, and if there is any roadway or anything, I, I face it away. Uh, you know, we're out here in rural South Dakota, and, you know, somebody could be out there, you know, target shooting or deer hunting, and what's that up in the tree? Well, I don't know. Let's shoot it. And so I always put them in places where, you know, they're less likely to be seen by humans and, you know, vandalized and things like that. So I try to find feral honeybee colonies in three different ways. The, the one way, which is really fun, is bee lining. It's the method that Dr. Seeley talked about in his, his book. You basically are catching foragers off of flowers and then using a bee lining box to set up a bee line. Another way, which it takes a little bit of luck, but if you can find water foragers on a water source, they are going to tend to be very close to their hive. They tend to go to the closest water source, so it might be within a few hundred yards and frequently less, but you're, you're going to have to have a little luck involved in finding uh, water foragers on a, on a stream or at a puddle. And then another way, which works the best at the end of the season when there's not a lot in bloom, but you have a lot of foragers and some warm weather, is calling in the bees with heated wax or honey. Any beekeeper who's extracted and opened the door to their honey house uh, knows that within seconds you're going to have uh, curious bees coming to look for that honey that they might be able to, to uh, collect and bring back to their colony. This is a picture of the bee lining box that I use now. When I was a kid, I, I used a cigar box that I had converted, but this is a, a bee box. It has two chambers. Uh, one has a door that I can use to capture the florager off of a, off of a, uh, a flower, um, and the other has a chamber with a, uh, with a clear plexiglass window. There's a removable door in the middle that I can lift up and allow the foragers to go to the clear side, then close it back up and go and catch more foragers. And after I have a, a half dozen or a dozen uh, foragers, that's when I can uh, start feeding them a little bit of syrup. Here's a little picture looking at some of the foragers that I had captured off of flowers. Uh, the middle panel is closed right now. Uh, I set it horizontal and I put a bit of dark comb with some syrup in the other chamber, and then I remove the middle door so and I also close the door that has the clear window and it'll be pitch black in there um, 
I sometimes will cover it with a towel or clothing so that there's no light leaking in that might attract the bees. And as they, they crawl around uh, looking, they, might, they, they will come across and find that bit of comb uh, with syrup that they'll start to feed upon. After about 15 or 20 minutes, I release the bees. These first two fly off, one, one, two. Those are not coming back, they did not orient. But this last one, she turns around and she gets her bearings. So she is going to come back. If she flew off two like those other two, then I would have just started over um, and caught more foragers, like if she just flew off like that. But this one, she turned around and got her bearings and oriented. So I waited and, and sure enough, uh, she ended up coming back. The first foragers are very, to come back are very timid and nervous. They're, you know, it's dangerous. There could be a spider, there could be a predator there. So I usually just open it up and leave it alone, leave it alone for 15 or 20 minutes so that many other bees have come and a bee line has been set up. Uh, and then at that point I start marking them so I can start recording how long is the round trip. I take a compass heading uh, to know in what direction that wild colony is. And then I mark some of the bees so I can time them. You know, how, how long does it take for them after they leave to go to the colony, offload their, 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 uh, their syrup, and then come back. And once you know that time, then you can estimate roughly how far away the colony is. You know, if it's over nine or 10 minutes, it's probably a mile away, a little bit too far. And so I would just walk down the bee line. You could actually close up your box with some of the, the foragers in there so that you don't have to go through the work of catching new ones and then just you know walk roughly that far down the bee line and set up a new bee line and if they're going back in the other direction oops you passed it you know go back the way that you came to look for it uh, if the bee line is you know the time away is very short you know three minutes or less it might be in the tree right next to you I had that happen once where it was literally the tree that I was underneath the entrance was on the other side of the tree that I did not see it was kind of silly once I realized how that I was basically you know, setting up a beeline right underneath the tree uh, where the where the feral colony was, but I didn't see it. The entrance was on the other side of the tree. Another method, if you are lucky enough to find one, is if you find water foragers, you know, at a water source, they're going to be going to the closest water source available to their colony, and usually it's very close, but it tends to work when there's not a lot of puddles or water, and it might not work if you're in a very you know, moist environment, but where we are in the arid part of, of South Dakota, there's not a lot of water around, and so they might go to a stream or a puddle or maybe a stock tank, you know, for the for the livestock. And uh, it's already made up, and you could just fall, track them back the way you would do normally with any other type of bee lining. And then finally, you can call bees in with honey and wax. Uh, this has been done historically. Uh, there have been accounts of uh, forest fires started by bee hunters. They tried to build a little fire in the forest to melt some wax and honey. Um, thus, I recommend that you be very, very careful to not do that. Um, I try to heat it with a propane torch, and I try to do it over, say, a rock or bare ground. So if for some reason that propane torch falls over, it's not going to like land on dry leaves or grass, and, and then you started a forest fire. Uh, it is much easier to call them in, but it only works certain times a year better, such as the end of the summer when there's a lot of foragers, the weather is warm, but there's not a lot of flowers blooming. Um, as any of you know, when you extract, you know, melted honey and wax will attract any bees in the vicinity within seconds and minutes. Once you have attracted some foragers, I set up a small dish with some sugar syrup, and then after they've been coming and going, then I mark them with paint the same as if I had set up a bee line in other ways. Sometimes I'll drizzle a little bit of that wax into that little dish to help attract them. And it's amazing how fast they'll start coming after the word gets out. Um, sometimes you can have multiple bee lines and that can make it confusing. You know, they can be going in different directions. Some of the areas where I find bees are fairly remote and rugged. I do that on purpose because I want to uh, I went to find feral bees that didn't escape from somebody's hive, you know, last summer. Uh, some of the places are so rugged I can't really get to them. Some of them are cliff faces, and, you know, I don't, I don't have rock climbing gear with me. At least where I live in the Black Hills, you know, they tend to be in the types of trees that you would expect. Usually they're at least 8 or 10 feet off the ground or much higher. They tend to face south or east. Uh, in the foothills of the Black Hills, they tend to be in bur oak because those almost all of the older trees are 
are hollow, and out on the plains they tend to be in cottonwood. I haven't found too many in ponderosa, simply because ponderosa pine tend not to be hollow, although some of the older trees may have heart rot or may have had a forest fire burn out at the middle, so you can find them in those type of very big older trees. And then I also find them in some of the areas that have limestone rock that have natural caves or even little crevices. Now if I can get up to the entrance safely, I'll put a queen excluder on the front. Now this is a, a queen excluder in front of a, a regular be old beehive, of course. Um, I don't have any videos of me doing it on a tree, mainly because I was more worried about the ladder falling down and me falling down and injuring myself in the middle of nowhere. But it basically is the same. If you put the queen excluder in front of the hive, in this case, or in front of the entrance, the colony entrance hole, uh, of a feral colony, the drones coming back from their mating flights, you know, on a summer afternoon cannot go through, and you'll have a whole collection of them you can collect, and, and I bring them back to my bee lab. And here's a, a, a picture of my setup with uh, my dissecting microscope and my uh, instrumental insemination apparatus. I already have uh, virgin queens that were ready or that are in the mating nukes that in, that I can easily access and bring back to my lab. And this is how I bring f feral genetics directly back into my own selected stock of, uh, of bees out here in South Dakota. Here's a setup of how we instrumentally inseminate, and this is a close-up of the uh, drone endophilus. And a close-up of the virgin queen bee uh, getting uh, aligned so that she's ready to be inseminated. They look kind of tough. We, we Afterwards, they're kind of sleepy. We, we do knock them out with, with carbon dioxide so that it's, uh, you know, they're not thrashing around. And, and hopefully it's as minimally traumatic of an experience for these poor little girls. And coming back to this slide right here that I showed from Randy Oliver's site, there's always a trade-off. Whenever we do selective breeding, we have to remember that as bee breeders so that we don't, you know, overly select for one trait or another. A few years back, I was selecting very, very aggressively for winter hardiness and for frugality. And I had lines of bees that would have, they would be little tiny colonies that they didn't eat much honey and they weren't very big, but they never really built up much either. They just stayed small and, you know, they were very gentle. And if, if I, I was just trying to have honeybees as pets, I guess that would be okay to have these little gentle colonies that didn't eat a lot of honey. But, you know, I, I want my bees to produce some honey, especially in a good honey year. And so, you know, once I realized what I was doing, that's I kind of got rid of those lines of bees. And, and that's just a perfect example of what you might do unintentionally. Uh, you might have some other uh, factors arise that you didn't even realize as you set about, uh, you know, trying to breed whatever types of uh, for whatever types of characteristics you're breeding for. The challenge of breeding for multiple characteristics at the same time is, you know, let's say you're breeding for six characteristics, you'd have to have one and a half million bees and or colonies of bees in every generation. I mean, that's impossible to win the lottery that way. So you're never really going to breed a per, one perfect type of bees. You're going to be breeding for multiple characteristics, and some of your colonies colonies may have more of a certain trait and less of another trait, but all things being equal, you're trying to improve the expression of all of these characteristics within the population themselves. So what we do is we use what we call selection index breeding. Whenever I've given this presentation, uh, if there's anyone in the audience who's a livestock breeder, they breed cattle or whatnot, they're very familiar about this. They're very familiar with selection index and z-scoring. Unfortunately, a lot of bee breeders are less familiar with it. Basically, it's a method for weighing the importance of a trait and then comparing that trait to other colonies within their breeding program. Uh, it's basically converted to what we call a z-score. And for those of you that don't know about statistics or z-scoring, um, let me explain to you what that is. It basically represents an individual's position within a given population. There's a formula for it. I don't have this memorized. I have a spreadsheet that does it for me. I just enter the data and then it calculates it for me. So if you're looking at a population of individuals, this is what we call a bell curve, and it represents the number of individuals for a given trait. And right at the middle is what we call the mean, which is where the greatest number of individual colonies are. 
Uh, you have a negative z-score and you have a positive z-score. Now whether you want a positive or negative really depends. You know, if, if it's honey production, you want your colonies that you're breeding from to have a positive z-score to be better than average. On the other hand, there might be a, a, a time when you want a negative z-score. For example, mite population. Let's just you're, let's say you're you're putting mite wash, you know, the population from doing an alcohol wash into your your breeding program as a selected characteristics. Well, in that case, you want them to be less than average, fewer mites than average. And the goal is over time is to shift this bell curve over. Basically, you want the mean to shift over so you have a higher number of colonies expressing that characteristic in that population over time. And sure, you're going to have some that are better than average and you're going to have some that are less than average, but you want overall the average number of colonies to have a greater expression of whatever that characteristic is. One barrier we have, you know, when we're talking about genetic diversity in feral honeybees, but even just in bees in general, is there's really not been a lot of genetic research. It, you know, many states have no information at all about what type of bees, feral honeybees exist there, or even any of the managed bees that they have. Uh, in some states, less than 50 total bees have been genetically sequenced or none at all. And so we really need more research to look at the genetic variation of honeybees as they already exist in the U.S., and maybe help determine which characteristics might be best adapted to different regions and situations. Now online there's people talking you know at length about how wonderful you know feral or local honeybee stock is and although it's useful we need to remember they're not super bees you know they're not just survivors I've been following the feral colonies in my local area, and many of them don't survive the winter. And this is consistent with what others have observed as well, especially a new colony, a new swarm that has moved into a new tree. Um, very few of them actually survive. Uh, when, if it's an established colony, it's more likely to survive. Uh, some years, like in Pennsylvania, they, they lose a whole colony, 44% uh, of colonies die due to a late blizzard or snowstorm. So feral colonies may have genetics that we want, but they're not necessarily going to be, you know, miracle survivors. And that's been kind of my experience as well. I find that the bees that I've, uh, the, 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 the bees I've crossed with some of our local genetics, they tend to do well in our climate, but they're not, you know, s survivors that, you know, you don't have to worry about mites or, you know, don't do other management uh, that you would have to do anyway, no matter where you got your bees from. So what does this all mean? You know, I've talked about a lot of the theory behind uh, genetics, and I've talked about, you know, what, what we've been trying to do as bee breeders, uh, both with some bringing in new genetics from other parts of the world and also those of us that are breeding bees. Uh, what does this all mean? You know, for one, genetic diversity is important for the health and survival of your colonies. I've heard people, you know, say, oh, I, I've got mutt bees, they're just crossed with whatever, and as if that's a negative thing. That might not be, you know, it depends with what your bees are crossing with. It might actually be better off to have a bee. We're not trying to breed purebred dogs, you know, we're not trying to do, you know, breed show dogs. It's it's so, having a little genetic diversity, or I should say a lot of genetic diversity, in, in, your, uh, in, the colony, in your colonies can actually be very helpful. If you're buying bees or queens from a commercial producer, ask or read about what is the origin of their foundation stock and, you know, what's the design of their breeding program, if any. Uh, there's some bee breeders that are very diligent about keeping track of things and trying to, you know, breed for a better bee. Uh, others, you know, they might just be producing bees. They're not really paying that much attention. They're eyeballing, you know, I think that's a good good colony. I think I'll grab some queens from, uh, from that colony and that's it. And they're not really doing any selective breeding as we know it. If you're a new beekeeper and you're not sure what type of bee might work best for you, try different types. You know, get some Italians, get some Carniolans, get some whatever, and then see what you like. You know, personal preference. See what does best in your area. And then if you have a preference for a certain type of bee, let's say you really like Italian bees, uh, try getting them from different sources. Maybe you'll eat like another source better. Um, if you're going to be breeding bees from that, that type of bee, then definitely try to get different sources so you have genetic diversity. If you have colonies that have low mite counts or other characteristics that you like, consider raising your own queens or making splits from them. Uh, this could be a very nice source of income as well. Uh, you'll find that other beekeepers in your area uh, typically are very interested in getting some local bees 
uh, even if they're not originally local and they weren't originally from feral bees. If you, if you just happen to have a strain of whatever type of bee that seems to do well and you're raising bee queens from them and making splits from them, um, I'm sure other beekeepers in your area would be interested in, in maybe um, having some of them as well. If you are breeding queens, try to avoid breeding queens from the same hives year after year. This is especially uh, important if there's not a lot of other beekeepers around to avoid uh, some of the inbreeding problems. I pay as much attention to the drone, the sources of drones and also the number of drones as I do uh, the where I'm grafting my queens from. I try to have drones from unrelated colonies flying in the, uh, in the drone congregation areas. And I try to select my breeding stock from many different desirable uh, traits, not just one or two, and I use a selection index to try to help me uh, select which which uh, lines of bees or which colonies of bees I should be breeding from. And then if you have access to locally adapted stock, you know, you might want to try them to see if they might work for you. Obviously, if you're in an Africanized zone, maybe that might not be exactly what you're looking for. You know, and then finally, remember, you know, Bat honeybees come in every type and in every strain, but so do the good ones. And with that, I would like to end my presentation. Uh, thank you so much for your time. I hope that you found this information uh, helpful and useful.